All right. Okay. Well, welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, and uh, also welcome our uh, VTLSS speaker for today, Ariane Briegel. I'm very happy to see her again this week. <laughs> we already had a meeting this week. Um, so I will make this short because I won't, don't want to take up too much time of a wonderful presentation with amazing images. So Ariane um, did her master's um, degree at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Um, and then she moved to the Max Planck Institute in Martin Sarit, um, and the Mar Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry, and did um, her ma a PhD on cryoelectron tomography with uh, Wolfgang Baumeister. Um, so after that, she um, decided to move to uh, do a postdoc um, in the States and um, went to Caltech working with um, Dr. Grant Jensen, which also has been a seminar speaker here a few years ago. And she stayed there as a postdoc and also as a research scientist. And after that time, she became a professor at Leiden University in 2015. And she's a co-director there of the facilities and the biology department. Um, I think the, the ribbon through her research is really looking at um, bacteria and lately phages, and motility, chemotaxis. So we have a long connection for over years at many, many, many meetings. Um, Ariana published more than um, 70 pub, um, publications on the topic and I cannot wait to see her presentation. So I will stop here and welcome Ariana. Thank you so much, Brigitte, for the kind introduction. And I'm super excited to be here, even though it's just on a screen and online. I hope maybe one day uh, we can do that in person again. Um, so today I want to give you a bit of an overview over what part my lab does. Uh, Brigitte mentioned phages, so I didn't have phages uh, in this presentation. <laughs> it just didn't fit. Um, but I'm going to tell you a bit about the uh, do in the lab on uh, trying to understand uh, microbial motility and how bacteria sense their environment um, and also how they help each other out. Um, so here what you see on the screen is a bacterium E. coli um, that senses a food source uh, at the bottom of the slide, so at the macaroons. Um, I put a sugar source on the slide and you can see that the cells can sense the sugar source and can actively move toward this. So um, the, the general topic in my lab is, is how microbes interact with their environment. And so chemotaxis or this behavior, how bacteria find their food is, is really central to it. Um, and I, I, I touched upon maybe a little bit on the other uh, aspects that you see here. So how they interact with each other, how they interact with the host organism, how they interact with phages. But I really want to focus on the, the chemotaxis behavior today. So I mentioned E. coli on the first slide. So here on the left side, you can see a, a depiction of an E. coli cell, this rod-shaped cell. Uh, and these have about seven to 10 uh, flagella, um, typically arranged uh, all over their cell body. These are these filamentous extensions that you see here. These are flagella, uh, which uh, the cells use uh, to move forward. So on the, on the right, you see um, a movie from the late Howard Burke's uh, lab website. Um, so these bacteria swim by rotating these flagella. And when all the flagella rotate in the counterclockwise direction, they form one large super bundle that propels the cells forward in the smooth swimming direction. Now, when one or more of these flagella start turning in the clockwise directions, the cells stop and tumble around. Now, to move toward a food source or away from toxic environments, the cells can control the duration and frequency of these run and tumble phases. Now, um, I'm interested in how this uh, whole system works on the structural level. And that's also why I ended up uh, in Leiden here. So we have uh, the cryoelectron microscopy center of the Netherlands uh, located here. 
Uh, and so just to give you an idea, if you if you haven't seen one of these modern cryo EM instruments, so this is what they look like. We have two of these machines in our facility. Uh, so on the left, uh, you see the, the closed operational state. Um, when you when you actually want to see what the machine looks like on the inside, you can open it up. So inside is um, a more uh, traditional looking uh, electron microscope hidden behind here. And so people always think I would, I will, I'm trying to hide my coffee mug here in the microscope. That is actually not the case. This is actually how we load our samples into the microscope. So I, I depend on these high end cryo electron microscopes to, uh, to do these studies um, that I will show you in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So how does cryo EM work? So I'll just uh, give you a, a brief uh, overview of how this works. It's actually um, quite straightforward, especially if you're familiar with traditional electron microscopy methods. Uh, it's actually uh, much faster and uh, easier. Um, so what we have here, this is a bacterial uh, culture. And what we do is we just take a small droplet of this culture and spread it out over an EM support grid. It's like an objective slide for a light microscope. And then all that happens in this fancy machine is it uh, blots away excess liquid from this uh, support grid. Um, so you only have a very thin uh, liquid layer on your, your support grid. And that gets plunged into uh, this cryogen here. So that's typically liquid ethane or a liquid ethane propane mixture that's cooled down by liquid nitrogen. And what happens here when you drop your sample into this cryogen is that uh, your sample freezes so fast uh, that water doesn't have time to crystallize. So everything is frozen in motion in a, in a glass-like ice. It's called vitreous ice, um, which, doesn't, uh, which keeps all the ultrastructure of your sample intact. And that's actually all you do. So you don't add any uh, additional contrasting agents or you do anything else with your sample. You can directly load it into the microscope. Now, this cryo preparation is only half of uh, what we need to do to do um, three-dimensional images. So when you load a sample of interest in an electron microscope or in transmission electron microscope, what you do is you shine an electron beam through your sample and collect a projection image. Um, so in order to get three-dimensional information, you actually need more than just one two-dimensional projection. And in order to do that, you do tomography, uh, similar to like a, a CAT scan maybe, where you, but there you would um, rotate the machine uh, around the sample. And here you rotate the sample inside the machine. But so you, you turn your sample of interest in the microscope while you collect a series of two-dimensional projections. And you can then take this series of two-dimensional two projections and, and computationally back project it to get a three-dimensional image of your sample of interest. So here's an overview of over the type of data that we get. So, um, so this movie is of a bacterial cell called uh, Bedella vibrio. So this is a predatory bacterium that preys on other uh, gram-negative microbes. So it uh, attacks them, it goes in between the two membranes, it digests the host from the inside, then it divides and uh, bursts out and, and uh, finds new hosts. It's quite a fascinating bacterium. Um, so here, uh, you see the individual features of that you can see typically. So the different layers of the envelope here in yellow, the ribosome in the middle here, uh, the uh, chromosome, then attachment structures like here at the bottom of the image here, the, the pili, on the other side, the flagellum that the, the cell uses to prop propel itself forward, um, the chemoreceptor arrays, secretion system. So it just illustrates you that you can actually look at individual cells and look at the individual molecular machines inside in three dimension at uh, macromolecular resolution. So it's very powerful to study um, heterogeneous samples like, like bacterial cells. So now back to 
to the original question. So how do bacteria sense their environment and move toward it? Um, so you might know a lot about this from Birgit, who is an expert on the system as well. Um, so here is just the basics of the E. coli system. So this whole system just works with uh, only 11 characterized core components. Um, and it's, uh, it uses these chemoreceptors that here are attached at the membrane um, that uh, sense the, the signals from the outside, like sugars, toxins that bind to these receptors. And these then control the activity of an enzyme called Kia. Um, that in turn then uh, starts uh, phosphorylating the shuttling protein, which in turn binds to the flagella motor and uh, changes the spinning direction. Uh, so Kia uh, and the receptors are linked together by another protein called KW. And these three uh, components form the basis of the so-called chemoreceptor A. And there's an additional system that's important uh, a bit later. So these, this chemotaxis system has an adaptation system that allows the cells to adjust to current conditions. So it can uh, also sense gradients and that's provided by these, um, by methylation enzymes that methylate the receptors and also demethylate them. So we'll talk about the Chiar uh, protein a bit later. So now I mentioned that the three core components that form these arrays. So one uh, are the chemoreceptors. So here in the middle, you see a crystal structure of uh, one of the E. coli receptors. And you can see they form these uh, uh, trimers of receptor dimers. So we have three dimers that form these uh, trimer arrangement here. Uh, I don't know if you can see this on, on the right. It's covered with, by by something here. I hope you can see it. Anyway, so here is a cartoon with uh, uh, of the receptors in side view. So we have uh, the, the sensing domain where the uh, attractants and repellents bind and the transmembrane region, and then these long cytoplasmic uh, tail uh, at their tips here at this pro protein interaction region uh, would be the interaction with the kinase uh, and the linking protein. Um, so the next part is the, the enzyme of the system, and that's called Kia. Um, so it's a, it's a large protein that forms homodimers and uh, consists of five domains, and each of the domains has a special function. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail, um, but so we have this dimerization domain and then these P, P4 and P5 domain. So these three domains form the structural um, stable core of, of this dimer. And then we have two additional domains, the P1 and P2 domains that are attached to the rest of the protein via flexible linkers. <clears throat> so the P1 uh, contains the substrate histidine um, and this P2 domain is the docking site for the shuttling protein. And last but not least, this linking protein, KW, shown here in green, here in a, in a co-crystal structure with uh, the P5 subdomain uh, of Kia, and you can see it's structurally uh, quite similar to this P5 domain. So it's a much smaller protein um, and similar to the P5 domain of Kia. Now, when I started looking into the system, it was, so these uh, structures were already known for, for quite a while. There's uh, a lot of uh, research done in the chemotaxis field. It was also known that um, these receptor uh, arrays uh, form by clustering together thousands of these receptors with the kinase and this linking protein. Uh, but how exactly these arrays are, are formed and arranged uh, was not known when I started working on this. Um, so since then, I think we have a very good understanding actually how these are, arrays are um, structured. So here, again, on the left, you can see the, the cutout of the cartoon. So we have the receptors, the kinase, and this linking protein. And this is here shown in the section through a tomogram um, with the same color. So in red, I labeled 
the chemoreceptor. So you can see these knob structures out here. These are the periplasmic binding domains. And then this dark line underneath is the inner membrane of the cell. So these receptors have the uh, sensing domain outside and the transmembrane region. And then the long cytoplasmic tail that end in this uh, layer called the base plate. That's where the kinase and the linking protein bind. So when I remove the um, false coloring, you can see the same thing. I hope you can um, identify this. So this layer here is uh, key A and key W, and then the receptors, and here is the membrane. Now, since we're working with three-dimensional data, we can rotate it around. So if we look uh, on top of this array, from the view of this uh, yellow arrow here and look down from the top. So we will, we will see a movie moving from the outside of the cell toward the inside of the cell through the array. So here um, we're going down, here's the chemoreceptors. You can see these nice trimers of dimers moving down and these densities here is the, the, the kinases. So this loops around so we can take a look again. So the trimers of dimers and here is the kinase. So what's striking about these E. coli arrays is they're highly ordered. So they're really um, uh, highly ordered hexagonal arrays and not only the receptors are highly ordered, also the architecture uh, and positioning of the enzyme underneath here. So our resolution that we get uh, when we do this type of work is about, um, yeah, at the moment, uh, maybe one to two uh, nanometer. So this is um, not high enough for, for solving atomic structures, um, but if you have an atomic structure of the components, you can fit it into the, the EM densities that we get. And that allows us to build these, these high resolution models of the array, um, combining high resolution structures with our tomography data. And this is what you can see here. So, uh, this is also the coli array, and in red are the, the trimers of receptor dimers. In green, uh, the linking protein, and in blue um, is the kinase. So now we uh, really understand how these uh, arrays form, how they, um, how they structurally uh, are composed. And if you extend this, so here's a cartoon of this, how this looks like. In, in a typical Delft Blau design. Um, so we have these um, chemoreceptors that are networked by these rings of the kinase and the linking protein. So we, I hope this works. So here we can see um, a larger portion of a, a model of this array. So the, this uh, P5 domain of key A and, and uh, key W together, they alternate and form these rings. And then the key A's, the, the, since they're dimers, they link two neighboring rings together. So we have this highly ordered architecture in E. coli with six of these rings surrounding one ring that doesn't contain a kinase. So there is some really nice research happening now um, that really looks into if these rings are actually empty or not. So it, there is a, a lot of support uh, that these are actually filled uh, partially or completely by just the linking protein alone. But the kinase is really organized here um, uh, in, in these other uh, rings. So that brings us to um, a highly ordered uh, arrangement E. coli. So I want you to remember this for, for the rest uh, of the talk because it will become uh, important later. So here is, is a simple model of what we think from the, from the structural tomography data, how uh, kinase activation works. So we have um, here these receptors. So this is actually a, a cryo EM maps um, that we collected a couple of years ago. So in the kinase uh, inactivated state, so these receptors are zip close together uh, and the kinase is in an inactive form with these uh, two domains uh, that are inflexible linkers, they're bound unproductively underneath the enzyme. Now, when this, uh, the receptors get activated, uh, you, see, you will see a change in the conformation that the receptors splay open. Uh, and then that also uh, causes the 
uh, kinase uh, flexible domains that are attached to the rest of the protein via flexible linkers. They get released, they're more um, flexible, and then they can um, initiate the, the phosphoryl transfer to the shuttling protein. So this is all published data. So I, I'd much rather tell you a little bit more about uh, some non-published data. And one of the things um, that we've done in the past uh, year or so was to think about uh, how we can actually use the chemotaxis system in E. coli for something more applied. So I don't know how it is in the States in these days, but the Netherlands is very big on applied research. Um, so we decided to see if we can build uh, a sensor uh, based on, on the E. coli chemotaxis system. So what we've been working on um, is trying to develop a, a sensor uh, that detects neuroblastoma markers. So neuroblastoma is a, a cancer that afflicts uh, mainly children uh, up until the age of five. And, and they, uh, the detection method is typically done by analyzing urine. Um, and so we thought maybe we can, we can uh, build a device that can do this very fast and cheap and easy. Um, so what we um, wanted to do is to see if we can use these uh, cancer markers um, and use E. coli to tell us if uh, these cancer markers are present or not. Similar to like a pregnancy test, or maybe these days I sh should say like a COVID uh, test. Anyway, so the two compounds we're working with uh, are DMH, DHMA, uh, which is a known attractant for E. coli. And the other one is, is VMA, which is uh, structurally similar, um, but wasn't known as, um, as a, a attractant for E. coli so far. But we could show it's actually a quite strong attractant for E. coli. Um, so here are simulations on the binding of uh, these two compounds uh, to the E. coli uh, serine receptor. Uh, so to, to give you a, a, an idea, so in, in healthy uh, urine, you have about one to two micromolar uh, DHMA present, and in neuroblastoma patients, it's up to 50 micromolar. And with VMA, uh, you, in the healthy patients, you have also one to two micromolar versus in patients, you have one to three millimolar. Um, so we did first uh, some very simple uh, plug and pawn assays. Basically, you, you put your, your attractant into an agar plug and then put it on a glass slide and see if your cells um, move toward um, this, this uh, source, this attractant source. So here is, is uh, with, with these orange dashed lines, you can see the border of the, the agar plug. So for serine, you can see the, the fluorescent E. coli here uh, assemble quite nicely. So serine is a very strong attractant. And the same uh, works for the other two compounds. Uh, and here in the control, you can see they, they don't attract um, the cells. Now, uh, initial tests with actual urine uh, showed us uh, some, some issue with our idea because there's uh, also serine in the urine. So urine alone was, was quite a strong attractant. But I think we have, we have solved this by um, using formaldehyde, uh, low, low concentration of formaldehyde to prevent the, the attraction towards serine. Um, so, Moving forward, the idea is to actually use not just these plug and pawn assays, but using high throughput uh, methods. And here we, we have these uh, micro tighter plates, which allow um, 96 well assays um, in a two channel system. So you can put the, the attractant in one channel and the, the cells in another, and then you can um, measure the, the attraction quite, quite fast and easy. So here's just a a few movies to show how this actually works in our hands. So it, it works quite nice. So in the control, uh, you will not see the border of the, the agar um, because there's no attraction. You can see it here, the cells accumulating with the serine. Uh, it's even, even clearer with these other compounds. So this is very much work in progress, but I, I like to show it that we can actually use E. coli chemotaxis for something applied. 
Now, when I started my lab, I was, um, I spent a lot of time before looking into um, studying the E. coli chemoreceptor arrays, but I was always interested in um, how chemo, uh, chemo arrays work in other bacteria. And I did an initial study in now over 10 years ago, where I compared the receptor arrays of, of all these um, species here marked with the blue asterisk. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, all of these uh, uh, species formed hexagonal arrays that at the receptor level looked identical. So it all formed these hexagonal arrays. So here are just four examples, but all of them, even, even the chemotactic archaea uh, had the same architecture in, in the receptors. Um, but when I started my own lab, I decided to, you know, to take another closer look uh, into arrays of uh, two species. So uh, on the one hand, we studied uh, chemotaxis system in, in the vibrios, so the causative agent of cholera. And on the other hand, we, we looked into um, a member of the spirochetes. So we didn't use the syphilis-causing uh, spirochete. We used, used a, um, a less pathogenic one. We used the one uh, called treponema denticola, which causes um, gum disease. So um, already coming from E. coli, which in total has five different chemoreceptors um, and, and only one system, coming to Vibrio um, is quite fascinating. On, a, on the other hand, also quite frustrating because it's incredibly complicated. They not only have one chemotaxis system, but they have three. And they all form structurally distinct arrays. So you don't have to remember uh, this table down here just, just to know that, OK, of, of all the um, known systems, we, we have three in the same organism. Uh, on top of that, Vibrio has over 40 chemoreceptors um, uh, that when I started working on it, we, we didn't know which receptors actually belong to which uh, chemoreceptor cluster. And the, the receptors are spread out over the whole uh, uh, two chromosomes. So it was really hard to um, make much sense of it in the beginning. Luckily, we also worked with uh, Dave, Davi Ortega, who is a um, specialist in chemotaxis and bioinformatics. So I think we untangled uh, the system quite well. So most of these uh, chemoreceptors uh, go to this array here, this cluster two, uh, and F6 array. And that's the only one I'm going to talk to you about uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, this is the only one that's known to actually um, control motility. So we have these two other uh, receptor arrays that are absolutely fascinating, and I could also talk uh, much more about those. But at, at the moment, we actually do not know what they do. So they don't seem to control motility, um, but I think we need to revisit that. But at the moment, um, the only one that's known to uh, control flagella motility is, is this one. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about this. So when I, when I started my, my, my lab and my first PhD student um, started working on tomography, I said, well, you know, let's take a look at the Vibrio arrays and let's do something very simple. You will have a paper in no time. It's easy. Just do the same thing what we do with E. coli. Um, and what, what we typically do with E. coli, we actually often gently lyse the cells because E. coli for tomography is, is huge, which decreases the quality of the images. So if we can uh, gently lyse them, it leaks out cytoplasm, the cells flatten, and you get much clearer images. So this is what you can see here. So this is a lysed E. coli cell, and here is a boxed out region. And you can see the chemoreceptor arrays, um, they're incredibly stable. Uh, was known already before from, from Joe Falke's work. So they're, they're rock solid and you can lyse the cells and, and it won't affect the structure of the um, E. coli arrays. Now, my student, uh, when, um, never came with negative news. So I sent her off and then I, I forgot for, about it for, for a few months and, and she never said anything. And at some point I asked her, about the status of this uh, experiment. And she told me that well, ev whenever she lyses these cells, she can't see ordered arrays. So here is a, a lysed Vibrio cell. And here in the box out region, there is actually a lot of chemoreceptors in there. 
uh, but they're just not ordered. And so we were first puzzled, but then we teamed up with Simon Ringard from the Max Planck Institute at the time um, and determined the stoichiometry of uh, the, the components that bind into the, in the array. So the kinase, the linking protein, and also there's an additional uh, protein in, in Vibrio that also integrates there. Um, and what we could see is that the, the abundance of the kinase is much lower in Vibrio compared to E. coli. So um, in, in E. coli, it's, it's a one-to-one -one or one-to-two ratio, depending on the, um, how, how filled the empty rings are with Kw. Um, and we have much less Ki in the Vibrio rays. Uh, so then we decided we want to know how the kinases are arranged in, in Vibrio. And since we couldn't use the trick of lysing the cells, um, we used another trick. So we used the mini cell system. So in, in the system, um, the cells um, don't know where their mid cell is. So they divide all over their cell body. And a portion of the cells um, just butt off at the tip of the cells. So they, they're very tiny round cells that um, don't even contain a, a genome, uh, but they contain flagella and chemoreceptors. They're fully functional. They can still swim around and and respond to attraction, but they're actually um, nanoscale zombies. So they, they don't have a genome. So here is a still image of this movie. So here we can see the chemoreceptors in the side view and in the top view. And uh, to remind you, uh, in E. coli, again, we have this ordered arrangement of the, the kinases here. Um, and in uh, Vibrio, compared to that, uh, here we see the kinases we have labeled in blue. So you can see there, there is no order to the distribution of the kinases here. Oops. So there is no order and there is much less abundance of the kinase. Now, does this have any, any functional meaning? Why would, would uh, the species maybe benefit from a less stable array? Um, so I think we have some idea and that uh, is uh, based on some work that we did on um, these more dormant cell states. So in, in Vibrio, uh, there is a state called VB and C, so it's viable but non-culturable cells. When these uh, Vibrio cells encounter long periods of starvation and cold temperatures, they, they enter this dormant state. And so this is a former uh, postdoc of mine, Dr. Susan Brenzinger, uh, who looked into this. So here um, you have a typical uh, Vibrio cell grown overnight. So that's um, typical cell, a bit curved, banana shaped. Um, and here in yellow, you can see the chemoreceptor A's. Um, now in these VB and C states, you can see a quite dramatic morphological change. So we use, usually see this dehiscence. So the, the outer membrane detaches from the inner membrane, the cell rounds up. Uh, the chromosome condenses, but the cells still have um, these chemoreceptor rays, but they're structurally um, not distinguishable uh, between these two states. But when we do uh, proteomics analysis between the states, we can see that the, the receptors that are actually present in these arrays um, dramatically change between, uh, between growth states. Um, so what we think is that uh, the receptors uh, are adjusted to the surrounding conditions. So whenever the cells encounter a different environment, they will um, actually change these chemoreceptors, chemoreceptor rays and um, add the receptors that they need. How this uh, might work actually on a functional level, we don't know, uh, but hopefully we'll find out at some point. Um, now I want to switch gears and talk to other system that we, we recently looked at, and that's the, the spirochete. Uh, so these are pathogens. Uh, this one uh, causes a periodontal disease. So these are um, very uh, thin cells that uh, move in this corkscrew fashion. They do this by uh, flagella that are uh, in the periplasm. So these flagella 
uh, spin, but they never go outside of the cell. They, they stick between the two membranes of the cell, so they wrap around. Uh, there are several of these flagella coming from each cell pole, and they overlap in, in the center. And they also have uh, chemo receptor arrays. So this is a work uh, already done a bit over a year ago by my postdoc, Dr. Elise Muak. Um, and in that system, uh, we also saw a difference between the E. coli arrangement and the, the treponema arrangement. So you can see that here. So in E. coli, again, we have these uh, rings with the, with the kinase dimers. And in treponema, um, the dimers actually arrange, arrange in, in ordered rows. Um, so we have per, in E. coli, we have per hexa, hexa, hexagon um, three uh, kinases interacting, whereas in, in treponema, we only have two. So at the time, um, when we published this, we, we um, proposed this model. And, and, and in treponema, we, we don't only have uh, one uh, linking protein, KW, but we have two in the genome. And the second one has an extra R like domain. And at the time when we published this paper, uh, we could show that by deleting this, uh, this key R domain, this array would lose some stability. Uh, and we could also see in, in, in the um, uh, tomography data that there is an extra density inside of these rings. So and this is a typical E. coli view with here um, the six uh, chemoreceptor dimers um, forming this hexagonal array. And in, in, in the case of treponema, we have this extra density in the center of the hexagon. And when we delete this QR domain, we, we see a decrease of this density, but not a disappearance. So there must be something else that forms this density. Uh, but at the time, it was likely that actually this QR-like domain uh, is part of this, this structure. Now, since then, oh, and, and um, uh, I think I mentioned this before. So we think that this, this linear arrangement of the kinases in, in treponema, again, has something to do with stability. And in this case, we think it allows this, uh, the chemoreceptor arrays um, to assemble uh, in, this, um, in these cells who, that are uh, incredibly, um, they have a, have a very high curvature of the membrane. So these cells are very skinny. They're only about 200 nanometers in diameter. And in the cross section, uh, perpendicular to the, the cell axis, the cells are highly curved. So we think that this arrangement of the kinases allows the assembly of these hexagonal arrays. But we decided to continue looking into um, this uh, KW with this QR like domain. Now, I mentioned in the beginning we have QR. Uh, is, is this um, methyl transferase in the chemotaxis system that uses uh, the um, methionine or SAM for short as a cofactor to transfer uh, and methylate these receptors. Now, the SAM uh, compound is not only used for uh, chemotaxis methyl transfer, but it's also in, in many other methyl transfer reactions uh, in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Uh, it's also important of the, for the synthesis of some amino acids. And it also has been implicated as an important uh, uh, in, in microbiome interactions. So we wanted to, to understand like what is the, the role of this uh, QR-like domain in, in this chemoreceptor array. So um, my postdoc, she's a, a crystallographer by training. Uh, so she tried to crystallize um, this domain, but she didn't succeed. However, uh, in, luckily for us, last year we, we got AlphaFold two, which is a which was a godsend for us. So we could model um, this kr like domain, and when we overlay it with with kr, we we can see it's quite similar. Uh, there is a, a shift in the position of this N-terminal uh, subdomain. And we can see that uh, the SAM uh, molecule fits 
and binds right uh, very nicely here in, in this domain as well. So it's it's a uh, uh, solvent exposed here and it binds quite well. Now, we tested um, SAM as a, as a chemoattractant. And it turns out that SAM is a chemoattractant for Treponema denticola. And we could show that it actually uh, interacts or acts as a chemoattractant uh, through this QR-like domain. So if you uh, delete this QR-like domain, they become insensitive to SAM. Um, so this is, uh, I think, the first uh, instance where uh, we, we really show that their KW can act as a sensor itself. And here is a, uh, an, a control for, for no chemoattractant for um, treponema. And, we, and here, at the deletion of um, this QR-like domain, it doesn't impact chemotactic. So it's really specific for a SAM as a chemoattractant. Now we found some other interesting phenotypes when we looked at these mutants. So I just uh, briefly want to mention this. So uh, spirochetes uh, have two, two states of, of being, one motile um, where they swim around and, and are chemotactic and non-motile states. And here they can form biofilms or these round body states. And so these round body states are, have been described already for, for a long time. And they, um, they, they, the, the current model is that the, the cells um, make these outer membrane blebs, and then the cell goes into, into these vesicles like this. So when we look at stationary phase cells, we see something quite similar here in low magnification EM. So we see at the pole, these, these blebs, and then in, I think in some you can see the, uh, the spirochete inside. So it's pretty similar to what other people have reported. By the way, all these beautiful drawings you see uh, are all done by my postdoc, who is uh, besides a fantastic scientist, also a great artist. Um, we found something else. Uh, very interesting, and that is body formation, uh, round body formation in log phase cells. So these are happy cells um, that make these uh, round bodies at the, at the cell tip, but they just round up and bud off. So there is, it's not like, like these other states where the cells then move in and, and are in, in a spirochete shape. So they bud off as these, these round bodies that are filled by one the contents of one cell. So we have we have a different type of round body formation that happens in log phase. And it seems that this QR-like domain also influences this round body formation. Uh, so here, the percentage of round bodies is, is much higher in the QR-like uh, mutant uh, the, compared to the wild type. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the SAM addition of SAM still affects those uh, and, and, and suppresses those states. So um, there has to be another way of, of sensing and controlling this. And then um, SAM also does not appear to affect uh, biofilm formation much. Okay. So a, a short summary of this part. So we, we looked really closely at this uh, uh, KW um, with, the, with this QR-like uh, domain attached. And we think it's a, it's a novel sensor in chemotaxis that is actually not dependent on the chemoreceptors themselves. Uh, it also functions to stabilize the array. Uh, and it also affects uh, biofilm and round body formation. So it's... Uh, there's quite a lot of open questions uh, to this, but uh, it's quite exciting. Now I want to wrap up this part just to say that um, I think there is a, an unexplored variability of chemotaxis arrays and um, a lot of additional functions that are characteristic to 
uh, specific species. So we only looked now at, at three different ones, but I'm sure there is a, a much more variability out there to discover. And now in the last part, I just want to uh, give you a brief uh, insight into another research line that we've uh, that we are pursuing since about uh, two years in the lab, and that is um, how. Uh, what about non-motile species? When when I usually think about bacteria, uh, in my mind they all can sense their environment and swim toward where they want to go. But what about species that are not motile? There are quite a lot of them. Um, how do they actually reach the sites where they need to go? And so we looked at the bacterium streptomyces, and it's uh, basically uh, happened because most of the people in, in uh, the microbiome cluster where I work, uh, work with streptomyces. Um, so these are fascinating cells in their own right, even though they can't chemotex or they aren't motile. Um, so they start off as, as a spore. Uh, when the spores germinate, they form these large mycelia. Um, at some point, they can also make aerial hyphae uh, that then uh, uh, produce these large number of, of spores. Now, Streptomyces actually likes to grow around plant roots. Uh, so we were like, how actually do the spores uh, reach the, the plant roots? And there are some fantastic uh, papers that came out in, in the past two years that actually show that um, Streptomyces produces a, a compound called Yosmin that attracts springtails uh, that then uh, actually helps dis distributing uh, these uh, Streptomyces spores over large distances. Um, but for the short distances to really re reach the roots, um, uh, we thought, well, we think actually there must be microbe microbe interactions responsible. So we, we started with very simple experiments, uh, no, no high-tech uh, cryo-EM. We went back and did uh, uh, traditional uh, microbio assays. Um, and so what we did is we, we mixed motile cell bacteria, uh, here Bacillus subtilis, but we also tried uh, other, other species like Pseudomonas strains. And we uh, stabbed these uh, cells in the center of the plate uh, together with the spores. So in this case, um, so these white dots you see are germinating streptomyces spores. So you can see in, in the mix with, with bacillus and streptomyces, you can see the uh, streptomyces colonies can grow all over this growth plate. When we put the spores in the center without a motile bacterium present, uh, the spores just germinate where we put it, just in the center of the plate. Here's a control that just shows uh, bacillus all over the plate. And you can do uh, really fun experiments uh, to, you know, when you spot the, the spores and the motile uh, bacteria in different positions. So here, the black asterisk is always the bacillus. And here we can see that the spores are always transported together with the, uh, in, in the, um, always in, so the spores are always transported with the, traveling colony of the bacillus. So here we have two colonies. It's also um, in the same direction here. And when we put the bacillus in the center, then the spores are transported outwards. Now, um, we are not plant biologists, but <laughs> we managed to grow Arabidopsis and put them on a plate, a, a little mangled here. But you can see uh, we do the same thing. We put the Arabidopsis plant here on the side. And in the mixture, uh, we can see that many of the streptomyces uh, can actually reach the plant roots, whereas when we put the spores here and without the motile bacteria, they just stay where they are. They can't reach uh, the plants. Now, of course, uh, we want to look into the microscope, how that looks. Um, so what you see here is a low magnification image from, from the EM. And these long rod-shaped cells, these are the bacillus cells. And then we have the streptomyces spores here. And so what you can see is that these spores are located close to the cell poles of the bacillus cells, but not quite attached. So to me, it looks like uh, a poodle on a leash. 
now when we uh, look at this, uh, the, one of our reviewers really wanted to see this, so we, we fluorescent the labeled flagella, uh, sheared them off of the bacillus and mixed them with the spores, and we can see they, they nicely bind around the spores. Um, I'll, I'll go over this quite quickly. So but, um, what, what we found is essential um, is the presence of the flagellum that for, for this dispersal. Um, it even works if the flagella can rotate. So in this, in this case, the cells can, can still glide, uh, but the presence of the flagella is essential. So if they can move on a surface, the transport didn't work. And also uh, in the absence of the flagella, the, uh, the transport didn't work. Now, how, how does this attachment work? So here you can see a cross section through a streptomyces spore with this thick spore coat. These, these samples are, are rather thick for, for imaging, so it's quite hard to see any, any details inside of the spore. Um, and so these spores also have uh, this extra layer. It's called a rodlet layer. Uh, it's composed of a set of proteins uh, that form uh, similar to like a sleeve around the cell. So it usually leaves the, the cell, the, the spore poles open and it's like a, a sleeve around the, the cell. So when we look at um, this with SEM, you can see um, these spore coats form these track-like um, track -like, uh, um, structures here. Interestingly, uh, the dimensions of these uh, tracks they're about 20 nanometers spaced, which is very similar to the size of the flagellum. And we were trying to get high resolution at this point. So at this point, we don't know, but it, it's quite tempting to think that the flagellum actually fits right into these grooves uh, of these, this rodlet layer. Um, and we could also show that these rodlet proteins are uh, necessary for, um, spore transport. So we, we looked at several different species of uh, streptomyces. So this is the typical silicolor, but we looked at other species of the streptomyces that, as well. Um, and one that lacks this rodlet, uh, these rodlet proteins, and that also was quite limited in, in the ability to be transported. And then we used a streptomyces silicolor uh, strain where we deleted this rodlet layer. Uh, there's also no transport. So this rather layer really helps with this, with this interaction. And then here is the movie. Um, so here we go th through a tomogram of uh, a spore and you can see all these flagella um, of the bacillus cell out here uh, interacting with the spore cord layer in purple. So, I, I've, I've shown you uh, several things that we've done in the lab, and, and most of them are really related to um, high, high resolution imaging, which is quite um, easy to use to actually explain our science to the general public. And we are fortunate that we actually have a microbe museum uh, very close to us in Amsterdam. It's just a, a 20 minute uh, train ride. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic museum, so if you're ever in the Netherlands, don't miss going to this museum. It's, it's a museum dedicated to microbes. It's, it's beautiful. It has lots of light microscopes inside. Um, and they're quite um, interested in improving their, their exhibitions all the time. So we're now working with them already for, for a couple of years to try and bring our signs into the museum. And it's uh, spearheaded by... Um, a former student of mine who is now like an imaging uh, specialist. Um, so we're working with uh, the museum and also we, we enlisted the help of a school class to help translate our science to the general public because it's incredibly difficult actually to, to um, not use phrases that a, a school child wouldn't understand. So we think we, we, uh, we explain it in easy words, but it's quite hard to grasp still for a school child. So it's uh, when we try to explain it, we then go to the school class and see if they understand and they give us feedback, uh, which helps us make, it, make our science more understandable. So I hope that uh, 
but in the you know next couple of months we will have the first movies uh, of our research uh, on exhibition there. So I hope you come all to the Netherlands and visit Micropia and see some more cryo in there. Um, so this is uh, my lab. Uh, the work I showed you today was done by uh, Elise Moak, who's done the Cheponima work and also the sport transport work. Uh, when did the Vibrio work um, and Adam works on the um, neuroblastoma sensor. We have fantastic collaborators, Dennis Klassen, who works, who's an expert in sport coat proteins, uh, Brian Crane uh, and uh, Chris Lee on the Spirochete uh, projects. Uh, Keith Cassidy does uh, all the modeling. Um, and then of course we can't do anything without uh, funding. cryo -EM is quite expensive, so we're quite uh, fortunate to have uh, financial support. And I'm uh, excited to hear if you have any questions. Super, thank you so much, Ariana, for this beautiful presentation and some exciting new research as well. And um, yeah, so just one comment on the microbe museum. I didn't know that uh, there was one in Amsterdam. I've been to museums in Amsterdam, but there were more art museums. <laughs> um, but you're right, it is, it is not easy to uh, explain in a simple way, but still meaningful way to, to children. So there's, there's actually, there are journals that where articles are being reviewed by children. Um, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I guess yeah, so I do so, yeah. I, that would be cool. Yeah, we. I I, I had no concept. I was like, okay, yeah. I can I can explain this easily, and then we went to the school, and then it's like, yeah, no, that's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I so, better go and get get into the question um, section. So, uh, one person had a question about: Do you know if the expression of different receptors is regulated at a translational or transcriptional level? I do not know. I have never looked into this. I think, well, I think this might be a simple answer that probably I would say both, but um, we know both, but transcription. So, so there's a hierarchy of, of gene expression um, with the flagella regulon and typically chemotaxis genes are the last genes that are being expressed. So they are regular, highly regulated. I think they, they were looking for a more broad answer. Um, Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I think, I think I'm trying to understand this in in Vibrio, and that just yeah <laughs> becomes very difficult there. So yeah. I don't I, in Vibrio, I just don't know. So this is a question for you, a specific one from Silke. Silke wants to know how do the arrays, their geometric structure, contribute to signaling? Do they, or would disordered arrays also signal? Or is it simply that clustering is important and clustering happens to give a geometric pattern without the pattern itself being important? So, um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so um, you can have signaling without the clustering, but you need the clustering uh, for signal amplification. So these are highly cooperative when, when they cluster together in an array. Now, how that cooperativity works is I think uh, not quite uh, understood. There's uh, quite a lot of um, effort, I think now to, to really understand this. Um, it seems to go through actually KW uh, through these arrays, um, but I think there might be actually more, more to the story than, than we know at, at the moment. Actually, I think there might also be some interaction at the receptor level itself, but it's, um, so I, I don't know any more than that. So we, we don't know. But I, so the, the clustering is important for uh, signal amplification. Now, the formation of, of this, um, um, this arrangement, so Nicola, it's actually quite, uh, it, it, it occurs um, just by the way these, these core units assemble so that the, the smallest functional unit of the chemotaxis system is two receptor dimers one key A dimer and two key Ws. And when you have 
uh, these several core units and and uh, bring them together so they form these these arrays this actually forms uh, natural I have actually a nice uh, movie somewhere uh, that shows us that if you have core units they automatically assemble in this in this hexagonal fashion great um my grad student Alfred has two questions Roy asked first how many spores can attach to the flagellum the first um so I think uh, typically there is just one spore on several transporter bacteria so so when when you when you mix the spores and the bacteria together uh, in, in liquid culture and, and take movies and you have a one-on-one -on -one attachment um, you actually stop movement so the mm -hmm. the bacterium tries to swim but the spore is so big and so heavy that that it you know it needs uh, I think more um, bacteria to transport one spore so I think it's more bacteria per spore so if if you have more spores per bacterium, I think you just uh, completely immobilize uh, the, the transporter bacteria. Does so that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's more like a dog sled. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the second question he has, does host interaction influence chemoreceptor expression in Vibrio? I don't know if that's no. Uh, so I am... Um, I think there, there is some work done by the Camille lab who looked into which receptors are expressed um, in the host, but we have not looked at this. At the moment, we uh, only compared it to the environmental stages, but it's a great question. Um, Next question is from Florian Schubert, and he wants to know, are the PA molecules bound to specific MCPs? And is that the reason for the PA distribution in the different organisms? So as far as we know, the PAs uh, do bind to, to all of the receptors. So it's not specific. I'm not sure if, if it's known if there is a preference. Mm -hmm. um, like if you, if you would look into mixed arrays and, and uh, there is a preference on which which type of receptor more prefers to bind to key A versus to key W. But um, I don't think anyone has really looked into that. So there might be some preference, but I think they can, they can bind them all. Um, yes, I think yeah. that's yeah. great. Um, another question, next question is, are there more key R's in spiral keys? Do other bacteria use key R to sense uh, SAM? And what is that's more many questions. What is the method? Like, maybe I drop stop here. <laughs> so are there more key R's in, in spiral keys? And do other bacteria use key R to sense SAM? So, so the key R in general, so they do have key R, but it's also used for, for the methylation and of the receptors. Um, so the key R like domain is is uh, common among the spirochetes. So the treponema is not the only spirochete that has this. Um, we have looked into um, other key Ws and other species, but I don't think um, we found many key R like domains bound to key Ws. However, there are other uh, if you look at other species, there are other uh, domains sometimes bound to key Ws, but we haven't really looked into this. So there might be other key Ws that act as sensors for something, but we haven't looked at those. And then the second part of the question, uh, same, same uh, person, what is the methylation like in spirochetes and how are the receptor, methyl how are the receptor methylation affected by different key Rs? Um, so we have not looked into the specifics of the methylation system in the spirochetes. I mean, we, we know it's it's present in the genome, but we haven't studied uh, the QR in, in, in the system. Right. Just looked at the QR like a uh, domain that's bound to the KW. So that's two different I, things. Yeah. I don't think we have a traditional QR, have... and then we have the QR like domain bound to KW. That's what we looked at. 
Okay, I'm yeah. going to go to the chat question. Um, Aaron Brock wants to know, do you think the denti, uh, treponema denticola data would translate well to the um, treponema pallidum? From what I understand, the motility systems are a little different and amazing talk. <laughs> well, thank you. And so I, I think that the general um, uh, architecture is probably quite similar uh, among all the spirochetes, um, mm -hmm. but we have not looked into uh, really into the details of other spirochetes. I did image um, another spirochete previously, um, Borrelia, um, but there we, we didn't get that high resolution data. So we we stuck with with treponema, which uh, gave us uh, really much better data. But I, I think um, I think the arrays are probably quite similar, but it's uh, worth looking into. And then my grad student Richard Sobi asked for the spore transport. Does this occur by bacillus subtilis either swimming, swarming, or both? So we think the main. Uh, transport mode is, is actually swarming and not swimming. So if you have them in liquid, they, they do attach, but there is not much, uh, you know, the, the motile cells are really limited in how they can continue to swim. So I think uh, it's, it's mainly swarming, at least in the conditions we, we tested. All right, um, I think that's all the questions um, and we need to we come to an end. So I, I thank everyone for um, attending and for um, asking questions and also for for this beautiful talk. Thank you, Ariana. And um, just wait. And if there are any other questions, I will email you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a great Friday afternoon and weekend.